Story One of O. Henry Memorial Award Prize Stories of 1919. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. O. Henry Memorial Award Prize Stories of 1919 by Various. Story One England to America by Margaret Prescott Montague from Atlantic Monthly one lord but english people are funny this was the perplexed mental ejaculation that young lieutenant skipworth carey of virginia found his thoughts constantly reiterating during his stay in devonshire had he been he wondered a confiding fool to accept so trustingly chev sherwood's suggestion that he spend a part of his leave at least at bishopsthorpe where chev's people lived but why should he have anticipated any difficulty here in this very corner of england which had bred his own ancestors when he had always hit it off so splendidly with his english comrades in the front here however though they were all awfully kind at least he was sure they meant to be kind something was always bringing him up short something that he could not lay hold of but which made him feel like a blind man groping in a strange place or worse like a bull in a china shop he was prepared enough to find differences in the american and english points of view but this thing that baffled him did not seem to have to do with that it was something deeper something very definite he was sure and yet what was it the worst of it was that he had a curious feeling as if they were all that is lady sherwood and gerald not sir charles so much protecting him from himself keeping him from making breaks as he phrased it that hurt and annoyed him and piqued his vanity was he a social blunderer or weren't a virginia gentleman's manners to be trusted in england without leading strings he had been at the front for several months with the royal flying corps and when his leave came his flight commander captain cheviot sherwood discovering that he meant to spend it in england where he hardly knew a soul has said his people down in devonshire would be jolly glad to have him stop with them and skipworth carey knowing that if the circumstances had been reversed his people down in virginia would indeed have been jolly glad to entertain captain sherwood had accepted unhesitatingly the invitation had been seconded by a letter from lady sherwood chev's mother and after a few days sightseeing in london he had come down to bishopsthorpe very eager to know his friend's family feeling as he did about chev himself he's the finest man that ever went up in the air he had written home and to his own family's disgust his letters had been far more full of chev sherwood than they had been of skipworth carey and now here he was and he almost wished himself away wished almost that he was back again at the front carrying on under chev there at least you knew what you were up against the job might be hard enough but it wasn't baffling and queer with hidden undercurrents that you couldn't chart it seemed to him that this baffling feeling of constraint had rushed to meet him on the very threshold of the drawing-room when he made his first appearance as he entered he had a sudden sensation that they had been awaiting him in a strained expectancy and that as he appeared they adjusted unseen masks and began to play-act at something but english people don't play-act very well he commented to himself reviewing the scene afterward lady sherwood had come forward and greeted him in a manner which would have been pleasant enough if he had not with quick sensitiveness felt it to be forced but perhaps that was english stiffness then she had turned to her husband who was standing staring into the fireplace although as it was june there was no fire there to stare at charles she said here is lieutenant carey and her voice had a certain note in it which at home carey and his sister nancy were in the habit of designating mother making dad mind his manners at her words the old man and carey was startled to see how old and broken he was turned round and held out his hand how'd you do he said jerkily how'd you do and then turned abruptly back again to the fireplace hello what's up the old boy doesn't like me was carey's quick startled comment to himself 
He was so surprised by the look the other bent upon him that he involuntarily glanced across to a long mirror to see if there was anything wrong with his uniform. But no, that appeared to be all right. It was himself, then. Or his country. Perhaps the old sport didn't fall for Americans. "'And here is Gerald,' Lady Sherwood went on in her low, remote voice, which somehow made the Virginian feel very far away. It was with genuine pleasure, though with some surprise, that he turned to greet Gerald Sherwood, Chev's younger brother, who had been, tradition in the corps said, as gallant and daring a flyer as Chev himself, until he got his in the face five months ago. "'I'm mighty glad to meet you,' he said eagerly, in his pleasant, muffled southern voice, grasping the hand the other stretched out, and looking with deep respect at the scarred face and sightless eyes. Gerald laughed a little, but it was a pleasant laugh, and his hand-clasp was friendly. "'That's real American, isn't it?' he said. "'I ought to have remembered and said it first. Sorry.' Skipworth laughed, too. Well, he conceded, we generally are glad to meet people in my country, and we don't care who says it first. But, he added, I didn't think I'd have the luck to find you here. He remembered that Chev had regretted that he probably wouldn't see Gerald, as the latter was at St. Dunstan's where they were re-educating the blinded soldiers. The other hesitated a moment, and then said rather awkwardly, Oh, I'm just home for a little bit. I only got here this morning, in fact. Skipworth noted the hesitation. Did the old people get panicky at the thought of entertaining a wild man from Virginia and send an S.O.S. for Gerald, he wondered? "'We are so glad you could come to us,' Lady Sherwood said, rather hastily, just then. And again he could not fail to note that she was prompting her husband. The latter reluctantly turned round and said, "'Yes, yes, uh, quite so. Welcome to Bishop Thorpe, my boy.' as if his wife had pulled a string, and he responded mechanically, without quite knowing what he said. Then, as his eyes rested a moment on his guest, he looked as if he would like to bolt out of the room. He controlled himself, however, and, jerking round again to the fireplace, went on murmuring, yes, 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 vaguely, just like the dormouse at the mad tea-party, who went to sleep saying, twinkle, twinkle, twinkle. Carry could not help thinking to himself. But after all, it wasn't really funny, it was pathetic. Gosh, how doddering the poor old boy was! Skipworth wondered, with a sudden twist at his heart, if the war was playing the deuce with his home people, too. Was his own father going to pieces like this, and had his mother's gay vivacity fallen into that still remoteness of Lady Sherwood's? But of course not! The Careys hadn't suffered as the poor Sherwoods had, with their youngest son, Curtin, killed early in the war, and now Gerald knocked out so tragically. Lord, he thought, how they must all bank on Chev, and of course they would want to hear at once about him. I left Chev as fit as anything, and he sent all sorts of messages, he reported, thinking it more discreet to deliver Chev's messages thus vaguely than to repeat his actual carefree remark which had been, oh, tell him I'm jolly as a tick. But evidently there was something wrong with the words as they were, for instantly he was aware of that curious sense of withdrawal on their part. Hastily reviewing them, he decided that they had sounded too familiar from a stranger and a younger man like himself. He supposed he ought not to have spoken of Chev by his first name. Gee, what sticklers they were! Wouldn't his family, Dad and Mother and Nancy, have fairly lapped up any message from him, even if they had been delivered a bit awkwardly? However, he added, as a concession to their point of view, but of course you'll have had later news of Captain Sherwood to which, after a pause, Lady Sherwood responded, "'Oh, yes,' in that remote and colorless voice, which might have meant anything or nothing. At this point dinner was announced. Lady Sherwood drew her husband away from the empty fireplace, and Gerald slipped his arm through the Virginian, saying pleasantly, "'I'm learning to carry on fairly well at St. Dunstan's, but I confess I still like to have a pilot.' To look at the tall young fellow beside him, whose scarred face was so reminiscent of Chev's untouched good looks, who had known all the immense freedom of the air, but who was now learning to carry on in the dark, moved Skipworth Carey to generous homage. "'You know, my saying I'm glad to meet you isn't just American,' he said, half shyly, but warmly. 
It's plain English and the straight truth. I've wanted to meet you awfully. The oldsters are always holding up your glorious exploits to us newcomers. Withers never gets tired telling about that fight of yours with the four enemy planes. And besides, he rushed on eagerly, I'm glad to have a chance to tell Chev's brother, Captain Sherwood's brother, I mean, what I think of him. Only as a matter of fact, I can't he broke off with a laugh. I can't get it exactly into words, but I tell you I'd follow that man straight into hell and out the other side, or go there alone if he told me to. He is the finest chap that ever flew. And then he felt as if a cold douche had been flung in his face, for after a moment's pause the other returned, that's awfully good of you, in a voice so distant and formal that the Virginian could have kicked himself. What an ass he was to be so darned enthusiastic with an Englishman. He supposed it was bad form to show any pleasure over praise of a member of your family. Lord, if Chev got the V.C., he reckoned it would be awful to speak of it. Still, you would have thought Gerald might have stood for a little praise of him. But then, glancing sideways at his companion, he surprised on his face a look so strange and suffering that it came to him almost violently what it must be never to fly again, to be on the threshold of life with endless days of blackness ahead. Good God, how cruel he had been to flaunt Chev in his face. In remorseful and hasty reparation he stumbled on, but the old fellows are always having great discussions as to which was the best, you or your brother. Withers always maintains you were. Withers lies, then, the other retorted. I never touched Chev, never came within a mile of him, and never could have. They reached the dinner table with that, and young Carey found himself bewildered and uncomfortable. If Gerald hadn't liked praise of Chev, he had liked praise of himself even less, it seemed. Dinner was not a success. The Virginian found that if there was to be conversation, the burden of carrying it on was upon him, and gosh, they don't mind silences in this man's island, do they? He commented desperately to himself, thinking how different it was from America. Why, there they acted as if silence was an egg that had just been laid, and everyone had to cackle at once to cover it up. But here the talk constantly fell to the ground, and nobody but himself seemed concerned to pick it up. His attempt to praise Chev had not been successful and he could understand their not wanting to hear about flying and the war before Gerald. So at last, in desperation, he wandered off into descriptions of America, finding to his relief that he had struck the right note at last. They were glad to hear about the States, and Lady Sherwood inquired politely if the Indians still gave them much trouble, and when he assured her that in Virginia, except for the Pocahontas tribe, they were all pretty well subdued she accepted his statement with complete innocency and he was so delighted to find at last a subject to which they were evidently cordial that he was quite carried away and wound up by inviting them all to visit his family in richmond as soon as the war was over gerald accepted at once with enthusiasm lady sherwood made polite murmurs smiling at him in quite a warm and almost indeed maternal manner even Sir Charles, who had been staring at the food on his plate, as if he did not quite know what to make of it, came to the surface long enough to mumble, Yes, yes, a very good idea. Countries must carry on together, what? But that was the only hit of the whole evening, and when the Virginian retired to his room, as he made an excuse to do early, he was so confused and depressed that he fell into an acute attack of homesickness. Heavens, he thought, as he tumbled into bed, just suppose, now, this was Little Richmond, Virginia, USA, instead of being Bishopsthorpe, Avery Cross, near Wick, and all the rest of it. And at that he grinned to himself. England wasn't such an all-fired big country that you'd think they'd have to ticket themselves with addresses a yard long for fear they'd get lost. Now, would you? Well, anyway, suppose it was Richmond and his train just pulling into the Bird Street station. He stretched out luxuriously and let his mind picture the whole familiar scene. The wind was blowing right, so there was the mellow, homely smell of tobacco in the streets, and plenty of people all along the way to hail him with outstretched hands and shouts of, Hey, Skip Carey, when did you get back? Welcome home, my boy. Well, will you look what the cat dragged in? 
And so he came to his own front door and, walking straight in, surprised the whole family at breakfast. And yes, doggone it if it wasn't Sunday and they having waffles. And after that his obliging fancy bore him up Franklin Street, through Monroe Park, and so to Miss Sally Berkeley's door. He was sound asleep before he reached it, but in his dreams, light as a little bird, she came flying down the broad stairway to meet him and— But when he waked next morning he did not find himself in Virginia, but in Devonshire, where, to his unbounded embarrassment, a white housemaid was putting up his curtains and whispering something about his bath. And though he pretended a profound slumber, he was well aware that people do not turn brick red in their sleep, and the problem of what was the matter with the Sherwood family was still before him. 2. They're playing a game, he told himself after a few days. That is, Lady Sherwood and Gerald are. Poor old Sir Charles can't make much of a stab at it. The game is to make me think they are awfully glad to have me, when in reality there's something about me, or something I do, that gets them on the raw. He almost decided to make some excuse and get away, but after all that was not easy. In English novels, he remembered, they always had a wire calling them to London. But darn it all, the Sherwins knew mighty well there wasn't anyone in London who cared a hoot about him. The thing that got his goat most, he told himself, was that they apparently didn't like his friendship with Chev. Anyway, they didn't seem to want him to talk about him, and whenever he tried to express his warm appreciation for all that the older man had done for him, he was instantly aware of a wall of reserve on their part, a holding of themselves aloof from him. That puzzled and hurt him, and put him on his dignity. He concluded that they thought it was cheeky of a youngster like him to think that a man like Chev could be his friend and that if that was the way they felt, he reckoned he'd jolly well better shut up about it. But whatever it was that they didn't like about him, they most certainly did want him to have a good time. He and his pleasure appeared to be for the time being their chief consideration, and after the first day or so he began indeed to enjoy himself extremely. For one thing, he came to love the atmosphere of the old place and of the surrounding country, which he and Gerald explored together. He liked to think that ancestors of his own had been inheritors of these green lanes and pleasant, mellow stretches. Then, too, after the first few days, he could not help seeing that they really began to like him, which, of course, was reassuring, and tapped his own warm friendliness, which was always ready enough to be released and besides he had got by accident what he took to be a hint as to the trouble he was passing the half-open door of lady sherwood's morning-room when he heard sir charles voice break out good god elizabeth i don't see how you can stand it when i see him so straight and fine-looking and so untouched beside our poor lad and think and think Skipworth hurried out of earshot, but now he understood that look of aversion in the old man's eyes which had so startled him at first. Of course the poor old boy might easily hate the sight of him beside Gerald. With Gerald himself he really got along famously. He was a most delightful companion, full of anecdotes and history of the countryside, every foot of which he had apparently explored in the old days with Chev and the younger brother Curtin. Yet even with Gerald, Carey sometimes felt that aloofness and reserve, and that older protective air that they all showed him. Take, for instance, that afternoon when they were lolling together on the grass in the park. The Virginian, running on in his usual eager manner, had plunged without thinking into an account of a particularly daring bit of flying on Chev's part, when suddenly he realized that Gerald had rolled over on the grass and buried his face in his arms and interrupted himself awkwardly. But of course, he said, he must have written home about it himself. No, or if he did, I didn't hear of it. Go on, Gerald said in a muffled voice. A great rush of compassion and remorse overwhelmed the Virginian, and he burst out penitently, what a brute I am! I'm always forgetting and running on about flying, when I know it must hurt like the very devil. The other drew a difficult breath. Yes, he admitted, what you say does hurt in a way, in a way you can't understand, but all the same I like to hear you. Go on about Chev. So Skipworth went on and finished his account, winding up, 
I don't believe there's another man in the service who could have pulled it off, but I tell you, your brother's one in a million. Good God, don't I know it, the other burst out. We were all three the jolliest pals together, he got out presently in a choked voice, Chev and the young un and I, and now— He did not finish, but Carrie guessed his meaning. Now the young un, Curtin, was dead, and Gerald himself knocked out. But heavens, the Virginian thought, did Gerald think Chev would go back on him now on account of his blindness? Well, you could everlastingly bet he wouldn't. Chev thinks the world and all of you, he cried, in eager defense of his friend's loyalty. Lots of times when we're all awfully jolly together, he makes some excuse and goes off by himself, and Withers told me it was because he was so frightfully cut up about you. Withers said he told him once that he'd a lot rather have got it himself, and so you can everlastingly bank on him. Gerald gave a terrible little gasp. I, I knew he'd feel like that he got out we've always cared such a lot for each other and then he pressed his face harder than ever into the grass and his long body quivered all over but not for long in a moment he took fierce hold on himself muttering well one must carry on whatever happens and apologized disjointedly what a fearful fool you must think me and and this isn't very pippy for you old chap Presently after that he sat up and said, brushing it all aside, "'We're facing the old moat, aren't we? There's an interesting bit of tradition about it that I must tell you.' And there you were, Carrie thought. No matter how much Gerald might be suffering from his misfortune, he must carry on just the same and see that his visitor had a pleasant time. It made the Virginian feel like an outsider and very young, as if he were not old enough for them to show him their real feelings. Another thing that he noticed was that they did not seem to want him to meet people. They never took him anywhere to call, and if visitors came to the house they showed an almost panicky desire to get him out of the way. That again hurt his pride. What in heaven's name was the matter with him, anyway? 3. However, on the last afternoon of his stay at Bishopsthorpe, he told himself, with a rather rueful grin, that his manners must have improved a little, for they took him to tea at the rectory. He was particularly glad to go there, because, from certain jokes of Withers, who had known the Sherwoods since boyhood, he gathered that Chev and the rector's daughter were engaged, and just as he would have liked Chev to meet Sally Berkeley, so he wanted to meet Miss Sybil Gaylord. He had little hope of having a tete-a-tete -tete with her, but as it fell out, he did. They were all in the rectory garden together, Gerald and the rector a little behind Miss Gaylord and himself, as they strolled down a long walk with high hedge bordering it. On the other side of the hedge, Lady Sherwood and her hostess still sat at the tea-table, and then it was that Carrie heard Mrs. Gaylord say distinctly, "'I'm afraid the strain has been too much for you.' you should have let us have him. To which Lady Sherwood returned quickly, oh no, that would have been impossible with, come, come this way, I must show you the view from the arbor, Miss Gaylord broke in breathlessly, and laying a hand on his arm, she turned abruptly into a side path. Glancing down at her, the southerner could not but note the panic and distress in her fair face. It was so obvious that the overheard words referred to him, and he was so bewildered by the whole situation that he burst out impulsively, "'I say, what is the matter with me? Why do they find me so hard to put up with? Is it something I do, or don't they like Americans? Honestly, I, I wish you'd tell me.' She stood still at that, looking at him, her blue eyes full of distress and concern. "'Oh, I, I am so sorry,' she cried. "'They would be so sorry to have you think anything like that.' "'But what is it?' he persisted. "'Don't they like Americans?' "'Oh, oh no, it isn't like that. Oh, quite the contrary,' she returned eagerly. "'Then it's something about me they don't like.' "'Oh, no, no, least of all that. Don't think that,' she begged. "'But what am I to think, then?' "'Don't think anything just yet,' she pleaded. "'Wait a little, and you will understand.' She was so evidently distressed that he could not press her further, and, fearing she might think him unappreciative, he said, "'Well, whatever it is, it hasn't prevented me from having a ripping good time. They've seen to that, and just done everything for my pleasure.' 
She looked up quickly, and to his relief he saw that for once he had said the right thing. "'You enjoyed it, then?' she questioned eagerly. "'Most awfully,' he assured her warmly. "'I shall always remember what a happy leave they gave me.' She gave a little sigh of satisfaction. "'I am so glad,' she said. "'They wanted you to have a good time. That was what we all wanted.' He looked at her gratefully, thinking how sweet she was in her fair English beauty, and how good to care that he should have enjoyed his leave. How different she was, too, from Sally Berkeley. Why, she would have made two of his little girl. And how quiet! Sally Berkeley, with her quick glancing vivacity, would have been all around her and off again like a hummingbird before she could have uttered two words. And yet he was sure that they would have been friends just as he and Chev were. Perhaps they all would be after the war. And then he began to talk about Chev, being sure that, had the circumstances been reversed, Sally Berkeley would have wanted news of him. Instantly he was aware of a tense listening stillness on her part. That pleased him. Well, she did care for the old fellow all right, he thought. And though she made no response, averting her face and plucking nervously at the leaves of the hedge, as they passed slowly along, he went on pouring out his eager admiration for his friend. At last they came to a seat in an arbor, from which one looked out upon a green beneficent landscape. It was an intimate secluded little spot, and oh, if Sally Berkeley were only there to sit beside him! And as he thought of this it came to him whimsically that, in all probability, she must be longing for Chev, just as he was for Sally. Dropping down on the bench beside her, he leaned over and said with a friendly, almost brotherly, grin of understanding, "'I reckon you're wishing Captain Sherwood was sitting here instead of Lieutenant Carey.' The minute the impulsive words were out of his mouth, he knew he had blundered, being awkward and inexcusably intimate. She gave a little choked gasp, and her blue eyes stared up at him, wide and startled. "'Good heavens, what a break he had made!' No wonder the Sherwoods couldn't trust him in company. There seemed no apology that he could offer in words, but at least, he thought, he would show her that he would not intrude on her secret without being willing to share his with her. With awkward haste he put his hand into his breast pocket and dragged forth the picture of Sally Berkeley he always carried there. "'This is the little girl I'm thinking about,' he said, turning very red yet boyishly determined to make amends, and also proudly confident of Sally Berkeley's charms. I'd like mighty well for you two to know one another. She took the picture in silence, and for a long moment stared down at the soft little face, so fearless, so confident and gay, that smiled appealingly back at her. Then she did something astonishing, something which seemed to him wholly un-English, and yet he thought it the sweetest thing he had ever seen cupping her strong hands about the picture with a quick protectiveness, she suddenly raised it to her lips and kissed it lightly. "'Oh, little girl,' she cried, "'I hope you will be very happy.' The little involuntary act, so tender, so sisterly and spontaneous, touched the Virginian extremely. "'Thanks awfully,' he said unsteadily. "'She'll think a lot of that, just as I do, and I know she'd wish you the same.' She made no reply to that, and as she handed the picture back to him he saw that her hands were trembling, and he had a sudden conviction that if she had been Sally Berkeley her eyes would have been full of tears. As she was Sybil Gaylord, however, there were no tears there, only a look that he never forgot, the look of one much older, protective, maternal almost, and as if she were gazing back at Sally Berkeley and himself from a long way ahead on the road of life. He supposed it was the way most English people felt nowadays. He had surprised it so often on all their faces that he could not help speaking of it. "'You all think we Americans are awfully young and raw, don't you?' he questioned. "'Oh, no, not that,' she deprecated. "'Young, perhaps, for these days. Yes, but it is more that you, that your country is so, so unsuffered, and we don't want you to suffer.' she added quickly. Yes, that was it. He understood now, and heavens, how fine it was. Old England was wounded deep, deep. What she suffered herself she was too proud to show, but out of it she wrought a great maternal care for the newcomer. 
Yes, it was fine. He hoped his country would understand. Miss Gaylord rose. There are Gerald and father looking for you, she said, and I must go now. She held out her hand. Thank you for letting me see her picture, and for everything you said about Captain Sherwood. For everything, remember? I want you to remember. With a light pressure of her fingers, she was gone, slipping away through the shrubbery, and he did not see her again. 4. So he came to his last morning at Bishop's Thorpe, and as he dressed, he wished it could have been different, that he were not still conscious of that baffling wall of reserve between himself and Chev's people, for whom, despite all, he had come to have a real affection. In the breakfast room he found them all assembled, and his last meal there seemed to him as constrained and difficult as any that had preceded it. It was over, finally, however, and in a few minutes he would be leaving. "'I can never thank you enough for the splendid time I've had here,' he said, as he rose. "'I'll be seeing Chev tomorrow, and I'll tell him all about everything.' Then he stopped dead. With a smothered exclamation, old Sir Charles had stumbled to his feet, knocking over his chair, and hurried blindly out of the room, and Gerald said, "'Mother!' in a choked appeal." As if it were a signal between them, Lady Sherwood pushed her chair back a little from the table, her long delicate fingers dropped together loosely in her lap. She gave a faint sigh as if a restraining mantle slipped from her shoulders, and looking up at the youth before her, her fine pale face lighted with a kind of glory, she said, No, dear lad, no, you can never tell Chev, for he is gone. Gone? he cried. Yes, she nodded back at him, just above a whisper, and now her face quivered and the tears began to rush down her cheeks. Not dead, he cried. N not Chev, not that. Oh, my God, Gerald, not that. Yes, Gerald said. They got him two days after you left. It was so overwhelming, so unexpected and shocking, above all so terrible, that the friend he had so greatly loved and admired was gone out of his life forever, that young Carey stumbled back into his seat, and crumpling over, buried his face in his hands, making great uncouth gasps as he strove to choke back his grief. Gerald groped hastily around the table and flung an arm about his shoulders. "'Steady on, dear fellow, steady,' he said, though his own voice broke. "'When did you hear?' Carey got out at last. We got the official notice just the day before you came, and Withers has written us particulars since. And you let me come in spite of it, and stay on when every word I said about him must have, have fairly crucified each one of you? Oh, forgive me, forgive me, he cried distractedly. He saw it all now. He understood at last. It was not on Gerald's account that they could not talk of flying and of Chev. It was because, because their hearts were broken over Chev himself. Oh, forgive me, he gasped again. Dear lad, there is nothing to forgive, Lady Sherwood returned. How could we help loving your generous praise of our poor darling? We loved it, and you for it. We wanted to hear it, but we were afraid. We were afraid we might break down and that you would find out. The tears were still running down her cheeks. She did not brush them away now. She seemed glad to have them there at last. Sinking down on his knees, he caught her hands. "'Why did you let me do such a horrible thing?' he cried. "'Couldn't you have trusted me to understand? Couldn't you see I loved him just as you did?' "'No, no,' he broke down humbly. "'Of course I couldn't love him as his own people did. But you must have seen how I felt about him how I admired him and would have followed him anywhere, and, of course, if I had known, I would have gone away at once. Ah, but that was just what we were afraid of, she said quickly. We were afraid you would go away and have a lonely leave somewhere, and in these days a boy's leave is so precious a thing that nothing must spoil it, nothing, she reiterated, and her tears fell upon his hands like a benediction. "'But we didn't do it very well, I'm afraid,' she went on presently, with gentle contrition. "'You were too quick and understanding. You guessed there was something wrong. 
We were sorry not to manage better," she apologized. "Oh, you wonderful, wonderful people!" he gasped. "Doing everything for my happiness, when all the time all the time " His voice went out sharply, as his mind flashed back to scene after scene to Gerald's long body lying quivering on the grass, to Sybil Gaylord wishing Sally Berkeley happiness out of her own tragedy, and to the high look on Lady Sherwood's face. They seemed to him themselves, and yet more than themselves, shining bits in the mosaic of a great nation. Disjointedly there passed through his mind familiar words. These are they who have washed their garments, having come out of great tribulation. No wonder they seemed older. We, we couldn't have done it in America, he said humbly. He had a desperate desire to get away to himself, to hide his face in his arms, and to give vent to the tears that were stifling him, to weep for his lost friend and for this great heartbreaking heroism of theirs. But why did you do it? he persisted. Was it because I was his friend? Oh, it was much more than that. Gerald said quickly. It was a matter of the two countries. Of course we jolly well knew you didn't belong to us and didn't want to, but for the life of us we couldn't help a sort of feeling that you did. And when America was in at last, and you fellows began to come, you seemed like our very own come back after many years. And, he added, a throb in his voice, we were most awfully glad to see you. We wanted a chance to show you how England felt. Skipworth Carey rose to his feet. The tears for his friend were still wet upon his lashes. Stooping, he took Lady Sherwood's hands in his and raised them to his lips. "'As long as I live, I shall never forget,' he said. "'And others of us have seen it, too, in other ways. Be sure America will never forget, either.' She looked up at his untouched youth out of her beautiful, sad eyes, the exalted light still shining through her tears. Yes, she said, you see it was. I don't know exactly how to put it, but it was England to America. End of story one. Story 2 of O. Henry Memorial Award Prize Stories of 1919 by Various. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story 2, For They Know Not What They Do, by Wilbur Daniel Steele, from Pictorial Review. When Christopher Kane told me his story, sitting late in his dressing room at the Philharmonic, I felt that I ought to say something, but nothing in the world seemed adequate. It was one of those times when words have no weight. Mine sounded like a fly buzzing in the tomb of kings. And after all, he did not hear me. I could tell that by the look on his face as he sat there staring into the light, the lank, dark hair framing his waxen brow his shoulders hanging forward, his lean, strong, sentient figures wrapped around the brown neck of Ugo, the cello, tightly. Agnes Kane was a lady, as a lady was before the light of that poor, worn word went out, quiet, reserved, gracious, continent, bearing in face and form the fragile beauty of a rose petal come to its fading on a windless ledge, she moved down the years with the steadfast sweetness of the gentlewoman, gentle and a woman. They knew little about her in the city where she had come with her son. They did not need to. Looking into her eyes, into the transparent soul behind them, they could ask no other credential for the name she bore and the lavender she wore for the husband of whom she never spoke. She spoke of him, indeed, but that was in privacy and to her son. As Christopher grew through boyhood, she watched him. In her enveloping eagerness she forestalled the hour when he would have asked and told him about his father, Daniel Kane. It gave them the added bond of secret sharers. The tale grew as the boy grew. 
Each night when Christopher crept into his mother's bed for the quiet hour of her voice, it was as if he crept into another world, the wind-blown, sky-encompassed kingdom of the Canes, Daniel, his father, and Maynard, his father, another Maynard before him, and all the Canes, and the hill, and the house, the willow wood, the moor under the cloud, the beach where the grey seas pounded, the boundless marsh, the lilac hedge standing against the stars. He knew he would have to be a man of men to measure up to that heritage, a man strong, grave, thoughtful, kind, with the kindness that never falters, brave with the courage of that dark and massive folk whose blood ran in his veins. Coming as it did, a world of legend growing up side by side with the matter-of-fact world of Concord Street, it never occurred to him to question. He, the boy, was not massive, strong, or brave. He saw things in the dark that frightened him. His thin shoulders were bound to droop. The hours of practice on his violin left him with no blood in his legs and a queer pallor on his brow. Nor was he always grave, thoughtful, kind. He did not often lose his temper, the river of his young life ran too smooth and deep. But there were times when he did. Brief passion swept him, blinded him, twisted his fingers, left him sobbing, retching, and weak as death itself. He never seemed to wonder at the discrepancy in things, however, any more than he wondered at the look in his mother's eyes as she hung over him, waiting in those moments of nausea after rage. She had not the look of the gentlewoman then. She had more the look, a thousand times, of the prisoner led through the last gray corridor in the dawn. He saw her like that once, when he had not been angry. It was on a day when he came into the front hall unexpectedly, as a stranger was going out of the door. The stranger was dressed in rough brown homespun. In one hand he held a brown velour hat, in the other a thorn stick without a ferrule. Nor was there anything more worthy of note in his face, an average long face with hollow cheeks, sunken gray eyes, and a high forehead, narrow, sallow, and moist. No, it was not the stranger that troubled Christopher. It was his mother's look at his own blundering entrance, and when the man was out of hearing, the tremulous haste of her explanation, he came about some papers, you know. You mean our morning post? Christopher asked her. She let her breath out all at once, and color flooded her face. Uh, yes, she told him. Yes, yes. Neither of them said anything more about it. It was that same day, toward evening, that Christopher broke one of his long silences, reverting to a subject always near to them both. Mother, you've never told me where it is. On the map, I mean. She was looking the other way. She did not turn around. I, Chris, I, I haven't a map in the house. He did not press the matter. He went out into the back yard presently under the grape trellis, and there he stood still for a long time, staring at nothing particular. He was growing up. He went away to boarding school not long after this, taking with him the picture of his adored mother, the treasured epic of his dark, strong father, his narrow shoulders, his rare blind bursts of passion, his newborn wonder, and his violin. At school they thought him a queer one. The destinies of men are unaccountable things. Five children in the village of Deer Bay came down with diphtheria. That was why the academy shut up for a week and that was what started Christopher on his way home for an unexpected holiday. And then it was only by one chance in a thousand that he should glimpse his mother's face in the down train halted at the junction where he himself was changing. She did not see till he came striding along the aisle of her coach, his arms full of his things, face flushed, eyes brimming with the surprise and pleasure of seeing her, his lips trembling questions. Why, mother, what on earth? Where are you going? I'm to have a week at least, mother, and here you're going away, and you didn't tell me, and what is it, and everything. His eager voice trailed off. The color drained out of his face, and there was a shadow in his eyes. He drew back from her the least way. What is it, mother? Mother! Somewhere on the platform, outside the conductor's droning, board, ran along the coaches. 
Agnes Kain opened her white lips. "'Get off before it's too late, Christopher. I haven't time to explain now. Go home, and Mary will see you have everything. I'll be back in a day or so. Kiss me, and go quickly, quickly.' He did not kiss her. He would not have kissed her for worlds. He was so bewildered, dazed, lost, too inexpressibly hurt. On the platform outside, had she turned ever so little to look, she might have seen his face again for an instant as the wheels ground on the rails. Color was coming back to it again, a murky color like the shadow of a red cloud. They must have wondered in the coach with her at the change in the calm, unobtrusive, well-gowned gentlewoman, their fellow passenger. Those that were left, after another two hours, saw her get down at a barren station where an old man waited in a carriage. The halt was brief, and none of them caught sight of the boyish figure that slipped down from the rearmost coach to take shelter for himself and his dark, tempest-ridden face behind the shed at the end of the platform. Christopher walked out across a broad, high, cloudy plain, following a red road led by the dust feather hanging over the distant carriage. He walked for miles, creeping ant-like between the immensities of the brown plain and the tumbled sky. Had he been less implacable, less intent, he might have noticed many things, the changing conformation of the clouds, the far flight of a gull, the new perfume and texture of the wind that flowed over his hot temples. But as it was, the sea took him by surprise. Coming over a little rise, his eyes focused for another long, dun fold of the plain. It seemed for an instant as if he had lost his balance over a void. For a wink, he felt the passing of a strange sickness. He went off a little way to the side of the road and sat down on a flat stone. The world had become of a sudden infinitely simple, as simple as the inside of a cup. The land broke down under him, a long, naked slope fringed at the foot of a ribbon of woods. Through the upper branches he saw the shingles and chimneys of a pale gray village clinging to a white beach, a beach which ran up to the left in a bolder flight of cliffs, showing on their crest a cluster of roofs and dull green gable ends against the sea that lifted vast, unbroken, to the rim of the cup. Christopher was fifteen and queer even for that queer age. He had a streak of the girl in him at his adolescence, and as he sat there in a huddle, the wind coming out of this huge new gulf of light seemed to pass through him, bone and tissue, and tears rolled down his face. The carriage bearing his strange mother was gone, from sight and from mind. His eyes came down from the lilac-crowned hill to the beach, where it showed in white patches through the wood, and he saw that the wood was of willows, and he remembered the plain behind him, the wide brown moor under the cloud. He got up on his wobbly legs. There were stones all about him on the whispering wire grass, and like them the one he had been sitting on bore a blurred inscription. He read it aloud for some reason, his voice borne away faintly on the river of air. Here lie the earthly remains of Maynard Kane, second, born 1835, died 1862, for the preservation of the Union. His gaze went on to another of those worn stones, Maynard Kane, Esquire, 1819-1849. This monument erected in his memory by his sorrowing widow, Harriet Burnham Kane. The windy gales of the West Indies lay claim to his noble soul, and took him on high to his creator, who made him whole. There was no moss or lichen on this wind-scoured slope. In the failing dusk the old white stones stood up like the bones of the dead themselves, and the only sound was the rustle of the wire grass creeping over them in a dry tide. The boy had taken off his cap. The sea wind, moving under the mat of his damp hair, gave it the look of some somber, outlandish cowl. With the night coming on, his solemnity had an elfin quality. He found what he was looking for at last, and his fingers had to help his eyes. Daniel Kane, beloved husband of Agnes Willoughby Kane, born 1860, died 1886. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. 
Christopher Kane told me that he left the naked graveyard repeating it to himself, forgive them, for they know not what they do, conscious less of the words than of the august rhythm falling in with the pulse of his exultation. The velvet darkness that hangs under cloud had come over the hill and the great marsh stretching away to the south of it. Agnes Kane stood in the open doorway, one hand on the brown wood, the other pressed to her cheek. You heard it that time, Nelson? No, ma'am. The old man in the entrance hall behind her shook his head. In the thin brown light of the candelabra, which he held high, the worry and doubt of her deepened on his singularly unlined face. And you might well catch your death in that draft, ma'am. But she only continued to stare out between the pillars where the lilac hedge made a wall of deeper blackness across the night. "'What am I thinking of?' she whispered. And then, "'There!' And this time the old man heard it, a nearer, wind-blown hail. "'Mother! Oh, mother!' The boy came striding through the gap of the gate in the hedge. "'It's I, mother. Chris, aren't you surprised?' She had no answer. As he came, she turned and moved away from the door, and the old man, peering from under the flat candle flames, saw her face like wax and he saw the boy, Christopher, in the doorway, his hands flung out, his face transfigured. "'Mother, I'm here. Don't you understand?' He touched her shoulder. She turned to him, as it were, lazily. "'Yes,' she breathed, "'I see.' He threw his arms about her and felt her shaking from head to foot. But he was shaking, too. "'I knew the way,' he cried. "'I knew it, mother, I knew it. "'I came down from the moor, and there was the willow wood, "'and I knew the way home. "'And when I came, mother, it was like the trees "'bowing down their branches in the dark. "'And, and when I came by the beach, mother, "'it was like a roll of drums beating for me. And, "'And when I came to the hill, "'I saw the hedge standing against the sky, "'and I came, and, and here I am.' "'She expressed no wonder, asked no question.' Yes, was all she said, and it was as if she spoke of a tree coming to its leaf, the wind to its height, the tide to its flood. Had he been less rapt and triumphant, he must have wondered more at the icy lassitude and at the cloak of ceremony she wrapped about her to hide a terror. It was queer to hear the chill urbanity of her. This is Christopher, Nelson. Christopher, this is your father's servant, Nelson. It was queerer still to see the fastidious decorum with which she led him over this, the familiar house of his father's. He might have been a stranger, come with a guide-book in his hand, when he stood on his heels in the big drawing-room, staring up with all his eyes at the likenesses of those men he had known so well. It was strange to hear her going on with all the patter of the gallery attendant, names of painters, prices, dates. He stood before the portrait of Daniel Kane, his father, a dark-skinned, longish face with a slightly protruding nether lip, hollow temples, and a round chin, deeply cleft. As in all the others, the eyes, even in the dead pigment, seemed to shine with an odd, fixed luminosity of their own, and like the others, from first to last of the line, it bore upon it the stamp of an imperishable youth and all the while he stood there, drinking it in, detail by detail, his mother spoke, not of the face, but of the frame, some obscure and unsuspected excellence in the gold leaf on the frame. More than once, in that stately tour of halls and chambers, he found himself protesting gaily, I know, mother, I know, I know. But the contagion of his glory did not seem to touch her. Nothing seemed to touch her. Only once was the fragile bright shell of her punctilio penetrated for a moment, and that was when Christopher, lagging, turned back to a door they were about to pass, and threw it open with the happy laugh of a discoverer. And then, even before she could have hushed him, the laughter on his lips died of itself. A man lay on a bed in the room, his face as colorless and still as the pillow behind it. His eyes were open, but they did not move from the three candles burning on the high bureau, and he seemed unconscious of any intrusion. "'I didn't know,' Christopher whispered, shocked and ashamed. 
When the door was closed again, his mother explained. She explained at length concisely, standing quite still, with one frail, fine hand worrying the locket she wore at her throat. Nelson stood quite still, too, his attention engrossed in his candle wicks. And Christopher stood quite still, and all their shadows, that man was the caretaker, the man, Christopher was to understand, who had been looking after the place. His name was Sanderson. He had fallen ill, very ill. In fact, he was dying, and that was why his mother had had to come down, post-haste, without warning, to see about some papers, some papers. Christopher was to understand. Christopher understood. Indeed, there was not much to understand. And yet, when they had gone on, he was bothered by it. Already, so young he was, so ruthless and so romantic, he had begun to be a little ashamed of that fading, matter-of-fact world of Concord Street. And it was with just that world which he wished to forget, that the man lying ill in the candlelit chamber was linked in Christopher's memory. For it was the same man he had seen in the doorway that morning, months ago, with a brown hat in one hand and a thorn stick in the other. Even a thing like that may be put aside, though, for a while. And by the time Christopher went to his room for the night, the thought of the interloper had retired into the back of his mind, and they were all canes, there on the hill, inheritors of romance. He found himself bowing to his mother with a courtliness he had never known, and an I wish you good night sounding a century old on his lips. He saw the remote patrician figure bow as gravely in return, a petal of color as hard as paint on the whiteness of either cheek. He did not see her afterward, though, when the merciful door was closed. Before he slept, he explored the chamber, touching old objects with reverent fingertips. He came on a leather case like an absurdly overgrown beetle hidden in a corner, and a violoncello was in it. He had seen such things before, but he had never touched one, and when he lifted it from the case he had a moment of feeling very odd at the pit of his stomach. Sitting in his underthings on the edge of the bed, he held the wine-colored creature in the crook of his arm for a long time, the look in his round eyes, half eagerness, half pain, of one pursuing the shadow of some ghostly and elusive memory. He touched the sea-string by and by with an adventuring thumb. I have heard Ugo sing myself, and I know what Christopher meant when he said that the sound did not come out of the instrument, but that it came into it, sweeping home from all the walls and corners of the chamber a slow, rich, concentric wind of tone. He felt it about him, murmurous, pulsating, like the sound of surf borne from some far-off coast and then it was like drums still farther off and then it was the feet of marching men massive dark grave men with luminous eyes and the stamp on their faces of an imperishable youth he sat there so lost and rapt that he heard nothing of his mother's footsteps hurrying in the hall knew nothing till he saw her face in the open doorway she had forgotten herself this time that fragile defense of gentility was down. For a moment they stared at each other across a gulf of silence, and little by little the boy's cheeks grew as white as hers, hands as cold, his lungs as empty of breath. "'What is it, mother?' "'Oh, Christopher, Christopher, go to bed, dear.' He did not know why, but of a sudden he felt ashamed and a little frightened, and blowing out the candle he crept under the covers." The afternoon was bright with a rare sun, and the world was quiet. Christopher lay full spread on the turf, listening idly to the clip-clip of Nelson's shears as the old man trimmed the hedge. "'And was my father very strong?' he asked with a drowsy pride. "'No, not so very,' Nelson stopped clipping, and was immediately lost in the past. "'Only when he was that way, five strong men couldn't turn him. I'll say that.' No, if they had to get him with a shotgun that day, t'was nobody's fault nor sin. 
If Guy Bullard seen Daniel there on the sand with an axe in his hand and foam like on his lips, and the little ones cornered where he caught them between cliff and water, Guy's own baby amongst them, and knowing the sickness of the canes as he and everybody else did, why, I'm free and willing to say twas his bounden duty to hold a true aim and pull a steady trigger on Daniel, man of his though I was, and man of his poor father before him. No, I can't make it right to lay blame on any man for it, no more that I can on them, his brother officers, that broke Maynard's neck with their tent pegs the night after Gettysburg. No, no. It was evidently a time-worn theme, an argument, an apologia, accepted after years of bitterness and self-searching. He went on with the remote serenity of age that has escaped the toils of passion, pursuing the old worn path of his mind, his eyes buried in vacancy. No, twas a mercy to the both of them, father and son, and a man must see it so. Twould be better, of course, if they could have gone easier, same as the old Maynard went, thinking himself the Lord our God to walk on water and calm the West Indy gale. That's better, better for all hands round. But if it had to come so, in violence and fear, then nobody need feel the sin of it on his soul, nobody excepting the old man Bickers, him that told Daniel, for twas from that day he began to take it on. I saw it myself. There was Daniel come home from other parts, where his mother had kept him, out of gossip's way, bright as you please, and knowing nothing wrong with the blood of the canes. And so I say the sin lays on the loose-wagging tongue of Bickers, for from the day he let it out to Daniel, Daniel changed. Twas like he'd heard his doom and went to it. Bickers is dead a long time now, but may the Lord God lay eternal damnation on his soul. Even then there was no heat. The curse had grown a formula. Having come to the end, the old man's eyes tumbled down painlessly out of the void and discovered the shears in his hand. Dear me, that's so, he said to himself. One thought was enough at a time. He fell to work again. The steady clip-clip-clip moved off slowly along the hedge. Not once did he remember. Not once, as the indefatigable worker shuffled himself out of sight around the house, did he look back with any stirring of recollection at the boyish figure lying there as still as a shadow cast in the deep grass. A faintly lopsided moon swam in the zenith. For three days now that rare clarity had hung in the sky, and for three nights the moon had grown. Its benign poisonous illumination flowed down steeply through the windows of the dark chamber where Christopher huddled on the bed's edge, three pale chill islands spread on the polished floor. Once again the boy brought the bow home across the shivering strings, and as if ears could be thirsty as a drunkard's throat, he drank his fill of the cello's deep, full-membered chord. The air was heavy with the resonance of marching feet, ghostly feet marching and marching down upon him, in slow, inexorable crescendo, as the tides ebbed later among the sedges on the marsh, and the moon grew big. And above the pulse of the march he seemed to hear another cadence, a thin laughter. He laughed, too, giving himself up to that spectral contagion. He saw the fat, iridescent bubble with the hill in it, the house of dreams, the beach and the moor and the willow wood of fancy, and all the grave, strong, gentle line of canes to whom he had been made bow down in worship. He saw himself taken in, soul and body, by a thin-plated fraud, a cheap trick of mother's words, as before him his father had been. And the faint exhalations from the moon patches on the floor showed his face contorted with a still set grimace of mirth. Anger came over him in a white veil, twitching his lips and his toes and bending his fingers in knots. Through the veil a sound crept, a sound he knew well by this time, secret footfalls in the hall, faltering, retreating, loitering, returning to lag near the door. How he hated her! 
it is curious that not once did his passion turn against his blighted fathers it was against the woman who had borne him the babe and lied to him the boy against her and against that man that interloper dying in a room below the thought that had been willing to creep out of sight into the back country of his mind on that first night came out now like a red devouring cloud who was that man what was he dying of or supposed to be dying of what had he been doing that morning in concord street what was he doing here in the house of the men who had never grown old and of the boy who would never grow old why had his mother come down here where he was so queerly so secretly so frightened christopher would have liked to kill that man he shivered and licked his lips he would have liked to do something bloody and abominable to that face with the hollow cheeks the sunken gray eyes and the forehead high sallow and moist he would have liked to take an axe in his hand and run along the thundering beach and catch that face in a corner somewhere between cliff and water the desire to do this thing possessed him and blinded him like the kiss of lightning he found himself on the floor at the edge of the moonlight full of weakness and nausea he felt himself weeping as he crawled back to the bed his cheeks and neck bathed in a flood of painless tears he threw himself down dazed with exhaustion it seemed to him that his mother had been calling a long while christopher what is it what is it boy he had heard no footsteps coming or going she must have been there all the time waiting listening her ear pressed to the thick old panelling of the door the thought was like wine the torment of her whispering was sweet in his ears oh chris chris you're making yourself sick yes he said he lifted on an elbow and repeated in a voice which must have sounded strange enough to the listener beyond the door yes he said yes go away he cried of a sudden making a wide dim imperious gesture in the dark no no the imploring whisper crept in you're making yourself sick christopher all over nothing nothing in the world it's so foolish so foolish foolish oh if i could only tell you christopher if i could tell you tell me what he shuddered with the ecstasy of his own irony who that man is that caretaker what he's doing here what you're doing here he began to scream in a high brittle voice go away from that door go away this time she obeyed he heard her retreating soft-footed and frightened along the hall she was abandoning him without so much as trying the door just once again to see if it were still bolted against her she did not care she was sneaking off down the stairs oh yes he knew where his lips began to twitch again and his fingernails scratched on the bedclothes if only he had something some weapon an axe a broad keen glittering axe he would show them he was strong incredibly strong five men could not have turned him back from what he was going to do if only he had something his hand creeping groping closed on the neck of the cello leaning by the bed he laughed oh yes he would stop her from going down there he would hold her just where she was on the dark stair nerveless breathless as long as he liked if he liked he would bring her back cringing begging he drew the bow and laughed higher and louder yet to hear the booming discord rocking in upon him from the shadows swaying from side to side he lashed the hollow creature to madness they came in the press of the gale marching marching the wild dark pageant of his fathers nearer and nearer through the moonstruck night tell me what he laughed what and abruptly he slept sprawled crosswise on the covers half clothed disheveled triumphant it was not the same night but another whether the next or the next but one or two christopher cannot say but he was out of doors he had escaped from the house at dusk he knew that he had run away through the hedge and down the back side of the hill torn between the two the death warm and red like life and the birth pale chill and inexorable as death 
Most of that daft night running will always be blank in Christopher's mind. Moments and moments, like islands of clarity, remain. He brings back one vivid interval when he found himself seated on his father's gravestone among the whispering grasses, staring down into the pallid bowl of the world. And in that moment he knew what Daniel Kane had felt and Maynard Kane before him a passionate and contemptuous hatred for all the dullards in the world who never dreamed dreams or saw visions or sang wordless songs or ran naked-hearted in the flood of the full-blown moon he hated them because they could not by any possibility comprehend his magnificent separation his starry sanity his kinship with the gods and he had a new thirst to obliterate the whole creeping race of dust-dwellers with one wide, incomparably bloody gesture. It was late when he found himself back again before the house, and an ink-black cloud touched the moon's edge. After the airless evening, a wind had sprang up in the east. It thrashed among the lilac stems as he came through them and across the turf, silent-footed as an Indian in his right hand he held a bread knife held but to thumb dagger-wise where he had come by the rust-bitten thing no one knows least of all himself in the broken light his eyes shone with a curious luminosity of their own absorbed introspective all the windows were dark and the entrance hall when he slipped in between the pillars but across its floor he saw a light thrown in a yellow ribbon from the half-closed door of the drawing-room. It took his attention, laid hands on his imagination. He began to struggle against it. He would not go into that room. He was going to another room. To stay him, he made a picture of the other room in his tumbled mind, the high bleak walls, the bureau with the three candles burning wanly, the bed, the face of the man on the bed, and when his rebellious feet, surrendering him up to the lure of that beckoning ribbon, had edged as far as the door, and he had pushed it a little further ajar to get his head in, he saw that the face itself was there in the drawing-room. He stood there for some time, his shoulder pressed against the door-jamb, his eyes blinking. His slow attention moved from the face to the satin pillows that wedged it in, and then to the woman that must have been his mother, kneeling beside the casket, with her arms crooked on the shining cover, and her head down between them. And across from her leaned Ugo, the cello, come down from his chamber to stand vigil at the other shoulder of the dead. The first thing that came into his groping mind was a bitter sense of abandonment. The little core of candlelight hanging in the gloom left him out. Its unstirring occupants, the woman, the cello, and the clay, seemed sufficient to themselves. His mother had forgotten him. Even Ugo, that had grown part and parcel of his madness, had forgotten him. Bruised, sullen, moved by some deep-lying instinct of the clan, his eyes left them and sought the wall beyond, where there were those who would not forget him, come what might blood of his blood and mind of his own queer mind and there among the shadowed faces he searched for one in vain as if that candle-lit tableau somehow holy and somehow abominable were not for the eyes of one of them the face of daniel the wedded husband had been turned to the wall here was something definite something christopher could take hold of and something that he would not have his mother seemed not to have known he was near till he flung the door back and came stalking into the light with the rusty bread knife in his hand one would not have imagined there were blood enough left in her wasted heart but her face went crimson when she lifted it and saw him it brought him up short the blush where he had looked for fright it shocked him, and shocking him more than by a thousand labored words of explanation, it opened a window in his disordered brain. He stood gawking with the effort of thought, hardly conscious of his mother's cry, "'Christopher, I never meant you to know!' He kept on staring at the ashen face between the pillows, long as his own was long, sensitive, worn, 
and at the cello keeping incorruptible vigil over its dead and then slowly his eyes went down to his own left hand to which that same old wine-brown creature had come home from the first with a curious sense of fitness and authority and right who is this man don't look at me so don't chris but he did look at her preoccupied as he was he was appalled at sight of the damage the half-dozen of days had done she had been so much the lady so perfectly the gentlewoman to no one had the outward gesture and symbol of purity been more precious no whisper had ever breathed against her if there had been secrets behind her they had been dead if a skeleton the closet had been closed and now looking down on her he was not only appalled he was a little sickened as one might be to find squalor and decay creeping into a familiar and once immaculate room who is this man he repeated he grew up with me she half raised herself on her knees in the eagerness of her appeal we were boy and girl together at home in maryland we were meant for each other chris we were always to marry always chris and when i went away and when i married your when i married daniel kane he hunted and he searched and he found me here he was with me he stood by me through that awful year and that was how it happened i tell you christopher darling we were meant for each other john sanderson and i he loved me more than poor daniel ever did or could loved me enough to throw away a life of promise just to hang on here after everyone else was gone alone with his cello and his one little memory and i loved him enough to to christopher don't look at me so his eyes did not waver you must remember his age the immaculate ruthless mid-victorian teens and you must remember his bringing up and so this was my father he said and then he went on without waiting his voice breaking into falsetto with the fierceness of his charge and you would have kept on lying to me if i hadn't happened just happened to find you here now you would have gone on keeping me in the dark you would have stood by and seen me well go crazy yes go crazy thinking i was well thinking i was meant for it and all to save your precious she was down on the floor again what was left of the gentlewoman wailing but you don't know what it means to a woman chris you don't know what it means to a woman a wave of rebellion brought her up and she strained toward him across the coffin isn't it something then that i gave you a father with a mind and if you think you've been sinned against think of me sin you call it sin well isn't it anything at all that by my sin my son's blood came down to him clean tell me that he shook himself and his flame turned to sullenness it's not so he glowered all the girl in him the poet the hero worshipping boy rebelled his harassed eyes went to the wall beyond and the faces there the ghosts of the doomed glorious youth-ridden line priceless possessions of his dreams he would not lose them he refused to be robbed of a tragic birthright he wanted some gesture puissant enough to turn back and blot out all that had been told him it's not his he cried and reaching out fiercely he dragged the cello away from the coffin's side he stood for an instant at bay bitter defiant it's not his it's mine it's it's ours and then he fled out into the dark of the entrance hall and up the black stairs in his room there was no moonlight now for the cloud ran over the sky and the rain had come it isn't so it isn't so it was like a sob in his throat he struck on the full strings and listening breathless through the dying discord he heard the liquid whispers of the rain nothing more he lashed with a wild bow time and again but something was broken something was lost out of the surf of sound he could no longer fashion the measure of marching feet the mad canes had found him out and cast him out 
No longer could he dream them in dreams or run naked hearted with them in the flood of the moon, for he was no blood of theirs, and they were gone. And huddling down on the edge of the bed, he wept. The tears washed his eyes and, falling down, bathed his strengthless hands. And beyond the phantom windows, over the marsh and the moor and the hill that were not his, the graves of strangers and the lost willow wood lay the healing rain. He heard it in gurgling rivulets along the gutters overhead. He heard the soft impact like a kiss brushing the reedy cheeks of the marsh, the showery shouldering of branches, the aspiration of myriad drinking grasses, the far whisper of waters coming home to the waters of the sea, the long, low melody of the rain. And by and by he found it was Ugo, the cello, and he was playing. They went home the following afternoon, he and his mother, or rather she went home, and he with her as far as the junction where he changed for school. They had not much to say to each other through the journey. The boy had to be given time. Five years younger or fifteen years older, it would have been easier for him to look at his mother. You must remember what his mother had meant to him, and what, bound up still in the fierce and somber battle of adolescence, she must mean to him now. As for Agnes Cain, she did not look at him either. Through the changing hours her eyes rested on the transparent hands lying crossed in her lap. She seemed very tired and very white. Her hair was not done as tidily, her lace cuffs were less fresh than they had used to be. About her whole presence there was a troubling hint of letdown, something obscurely slovenly, a kind of awkward and unlovely nakedness. She really spoke to him for the first time at the junction when he stood before her, slim and uncouth, under the huge burden of Ugo fumbling through his leave-taking. Christopher, she said, try not to think of me, always as, as, well, when you're older, Christopher, you'll know what I mean. That was the last time he ever heard her speak. He saw her once again, but the telegram was delayed, and his train was late, and when he came beside her bed she said nothing. She looked into his eyes searchingly for a long while, and died. That space stands for the interval of silence that fell after Christopher had told me the story. I thought he had quite finished. He sat motionless, his shoulders fallen forward, his eyes fixed in the heart of the incandescent globe over the dressing-table, his long fingers wrapped around the neck of the cello. And so she got me through those years, he said, those nip-and-tuck years that followed, by her lie. Insanity is a queer thing, he went on, still brooding, into the light. There's more of it about than we're apt to think. It works in so many ways, in hobbies, arts, philosophies. Music is a kind of insanity. I know. I've got mine pinned up in the music now, and I think I can keep it there now and save my soul. Yours? Yes, mine. I know now, now that it's safe for me to know. I was down at that village by the beach a year or so ago. I'm a cane, of course, one of the crazy canes, after all. John Sanderson was born in the village and lived there till his death. Only once that folks could remember had he been away, and that was when he took some papers to the city for Mrs. Kane to sign. He was caretaker at the old Kane place the last ten years of his life, and deaf, they said, since his tenth year, deaf as a post. And they told me something else. They said there was a story that before my father, Daniel, married her, my mother had been an actress. An actress! You'll understand that I needed no one to tell me that. They told me that they had heard a story that she was a great actress. Dear God, if they could only know! When I think of that night and that setting, that scene, it killed her, and it got me over the wall. End of story two.
Story 3 of O. Henry Memorial Award Prize Stories of 1919 by Various. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story 3, They Grind Exceeding Small, by Ben Ames Williams, from Saturday Evening Post. I telephoned down the hill to Hazen Kinch. Hazen, I asked, are you going to town today? Yes, yes, he said abruptly in his quick, harsh fashion. Of course I'm going to town i've a matter of business i suggested come along he invited brusquely come along there was not another man within forty miles to whom he would have given that invitation i'll be down in ten minutes i promised him and i went to pull on my pontiacs and heavy half-boots over them and started downhill through the sandy snow it was bitterly cold it had been a cold winter the bay i could see it from my window was frozen over for a dozen miles east and west and thirty north and south and that had not happened in close to a score of years men were freighting across to the islands with heavy teams automobiles had beaten a rough road along the course the steamers took in summer a man who had ventured to stock one of the lower islands with foxes for the sake of their fur counting on the water to hold them prisoners had gone bankrupt when his stock in trade escaped across the ice bitterly cold and steadily cold and deep snow lay upon the hills blue-white in the distance the evergreens were blue-black blotches on the whiteness the birches almost indistinguishable were like trees in camouflage to me the hills are never so grand as in this winter coat they wear it is easy to believe that a brooding god dwells upon them i wondered as i ploughed my way down to hazen kinch's farm whether god did indeed dwell among these hills and i wondered what he thought of hazen kinch this was no new matter of thought with me i had given some thought to hazen in the past i was interested in the man and in that which should come to him he was it seemed to me a problem in fundamental ethics he was as matters stood a demonstration of the essential uprightness of things as they are the biologist would have called him a sport a deviation from type a violation of all the proper laws of life that such a man should live and grow great and prosper was not fitting in a well-regulated world it could not be yet hazen kinch did live he had grown in his small way great and by our lights he had prospered therefore i watched him there was about the man the fascination which clothes a tightrope walker above niagara an aeronaut in the midst of the nose-dive the spectator stares with half-caught breath afraid to see and afraid to miss seeing the ultimate catastrophe sometimes i wondered whether hazen kinch suspected this attitude on my part it was not impossible there was a cynical courage in the man it might have amused him certainly i was the only man who had in any degree his confidence i have said there was not another within forty miles whom he would have given a lift to town i doubt if there was another man anywhere for whom he would have done this small favor he seemed to find a mocking sort of pleasure in my company when i came to his house he was in the barn harnessing his mare to the sleigh the mare was a good animal fast and strong she feared and she hated hazen i could see her roll her eyes backward at him as he adjusted the traces he called to me without turning shut the door shut the door damn the cold i slid the door shut behind me there was within the barn the curious chill warmth which housed animals generate to protect themselves against our winters it will snow i told hazen i was not sure you would go he laughed crookedly jerking at the trace snow he exclaimed any man would think you were the personal manager of the weather why do you say it will snow the drift of the clouds and it's warmer i told him i'm not having it snowing he said and looked at me and cackled he was a little thin old man with meagre whiskers and a curious precision of speech and i think he got some enjoyment out of watching my expression at such remarks as this he elaborated his assumption that the universe was conducted for his benefit in order to see my silent revolt at the suggestion i'll not have it snowing he said open the door he led the mare out and stopped by the kitchen door come in he said a hot drink i went with him into the kitchen 
His wife was there and their child. The woman was lean and frail, and she was afraid of him. The countryside said he had taken her in payment of a bad debt. Her father had owed him money, which he could not pay. I decided it was time I had a wife, Hazen used to say to me. The child was on the floor. The woman had a drink of milk and egg and rum, hot and ready for us. We drank, and Hazen knelt beside the child. A boy baby, not yet two years old. It is an ugly thing to say, but I hated this child. There was evil malevolence in his baby eyes. I have sometimes thought the gray devils must have left just such hate-bred babies as this in France. Also, he was deformed, a twisted leg. The women of the neighborhood sometimes said he would be better dead, but Hazen Kinch loved him. He lifted him in his arms now with a curious passion in his movement, and the child stared at him sullenly. When the mother came near, the baby squalled at her, and Hazen said roughly, "'Stand away! Leave him alone!' She moved back furtively, and Hazen asked me, displaying the child, "'A fine boy, eh?' I said nothing, and in his cracked old voice he mumbled endearments to the baby. I had often wondered whether his love for the child redeemed the man, or merely made him vulnerable. Certainly any harm that might come to the baby would be a crushing blow to Hazen. He put the child down on the floor again, and he said to the woman curtly, "'Tend him well.' She nodded. There was a dumb submission in her eyes, but through this blank veil I had seen now and then a blaze of pain. Hazen went out of the door without further word to her, and I followed him. We got into the sleigh, bundling ourselves into the robes for the six-mile drive along the drifted road to town. There was a feeling of storm in the air. I looked at the sky, and so did Hazen Kinch. He guessed what I would have said, and he answered me before I could speak. "'I'll not have it snowing,' he said, and leered at me. Nevertheless, I knew the storm would come. The mare turned out of the barnyard and plowed through a drift and struck hard-packed road. Her hoofs beat a swift tattoo. Our runners sang beneath us. We dropped to the little bridge and across, and began the mile-long climb to the top of Rayburn Hill. The road from Hazen's house to town is compounded of such ups and downs. At the top of the hill we paused for a moment to breathe the mare, paused just in front of the big old Rayburn house that has stood there for more years than most of us remember. It was closed and shuttered and deserted, and Hazen dipped his whip toward it and said meanly, an ugly, improvident lot the Rayburns were. I had known only one of them, the eldest son. A fine man, I had thought him. Picking apples in his orchard, he fell one October and broke his neck. His widow tried to make a go of the place, but she borrowed of Hazen, and he had evicted her this three months back. It was one of the lesser evils he had done. I looked at the house and at him, and he clucked to the mare, and we dipped down into the steep valley below the hill. The wind had a sweep in that valley, and there was a drift of snow across it and across the road. This drift was well packed by the wind, but when we drove over its top, our left-hand runner broke through the combing, and we tumbled into the snow, Hazen and I. We were well entangled in the rugs. The mare gave a frightened start, but Hazen had held the reins and the whip so that she could not break away. We got up together, he and I, and we righted the sleigh and set it upon the road again. I remember that it was becoming bitter cold, and the sun was no longer shining. There was a steel-gray veil drawn across the bay. When the sleigh was upright, Hazen went forward and stood beside the mare. Some men, blaming the beast without reason, would have beaten her. They would have cursed, cried out upon her. That was not the cut of Hazen Kinch, but I could see that he was angry, and I was not surprised when he reached up and gripped the horse's ear. He pulled the mare's head down and twisted the ear viciously, all in a silence that was deadly. The mare snorted and tried to rear back, and Hazen clapped the butt of his whip across her knees. She stood still, quivering, and he wrenched at her ear again. Now, he said softly, keep the road. And he returned and climbed to his place beside me in the sleigh. 
I said nothing. I might have interfered, but something had always impelled me to keep back my hand from Hazen Kinch. We drove on, and the mare was lame. Though Hazen pushed her, we were slow in coming to town, and before we reached Hazen's office the swirling snow was whirling down, a pressure of driving, swirling flakes like a heavy white hand. I left Hazen at the stair that led to his office, and I went about my business of the day. He said as I turned away, "'Be here at three. I nodded, but I did not think we should drive home that afternoon. I had some knowledge of storms. That which had brought me to town was not engrossing. I found time to go to the stable and see Hazen's mare. There was an ugly welt across her knees, and some blood had flowed. The stableman had tended the welt and cursed Hazen in my hearing. It was still snowing, and the stable boss, looking out at the driving flakes, spat upon the ground and said to me, "'Them legs'll go stiff. That mare won't go home tonight. Oh, I think you are right,' I agreed. "'The white-whiskered skunk,' he said, and I knew he spoke of Hazen. At a quarter of three I took myself to Hazen Kinch's office. It was not much of an office, not that Hazen could not have afforded a better. But it was up two flights, an attic room ill-lighted. A small, airtight stove kept the room stifling hot. The room was also airtight. Hazen had a table and two chairs and an iron safe in the corner. He put a pathetic trust in that safe. I believe I could have opened it with a screwdriver. I met him as I climbed the stairs. He said harshly, "'I'm going to telephone. They say the road's impassable.' He had no telephone in his office. He used one in the store below, a small economy fairly typical of Hazen. "'I'll wait in the office,' I told him. "'Go ahead,' he agreed, halfway down the stairs. I went to his office and closed the drafts of the stove. It was red-hot, and tried to open the one window, but it was nailed fast. Then Hazen came back up the stairs, grumbling. "'Damn the snow,' he said. "'The wire is down.' "'Where to?' I asked. "'My house, man, to my house.' You wanted to telephone home that you, I can't get home tonight, you'll have to go to the hotel. I nodded good-naturedly. All right, you too, I suppose. I'll sleep here, he said. I looked around. There was no bed, no cot, nothing but the two stiff chairs. He saw my glance and said angrily, I've slept on the floor before. I was always interested in the man's mental processes. You wanted to telephone Mrs. Kinch not to worry? I suggested. Shah, let her fret, said Hazen. I wanted to ask after my boy. His eyes expanded. He rubbed his hands a little, cackling. A fine boy, sir, a fine boy. It was then we heard Don Marshy coming up the stairs. We heard his stumbling steps as he began the last flight, and Hazen seemed to cock his ears as he listened. Then he sat still and watched the door. The steps climbed nearer, they stopped in the dim little hall outside the door, and someone fumbled with the knob. When the door opened, we saw who it was. I knew Marshy. He lived a little beyond Hazen on the same road, lived in a two-room cabin, it was little more, with his wife and his five children, lived meanly and pitiably, groveling in the soil for daily bread, sweating life out of the earth, life and no more a thin man racking thin a forward thrusting neck and a bony face and a sad and drooping moustache about his mouth his eyes were meek and weary he stood in the doorway blinking at us and with his gloved hands they were stiff and awkward with the cold he unwound the ragged muffler that was about his neck and he brushed weakly at the snow upon his head and his shoulders hazen said angrily come in do you want my stove to heat the town Stone shuffled in, and he shut the door behind him. He said, "'Howdy, Mr. Kinch,' and he smiled in a humble and placating way. Hazen said, "'What's your business? Your interest is due.' Doan nodded. "'Yeah, I, I know, Mr. Kinch. I, I can't pay it all.' Kinch exclaimed impatiently, "'An old story. How much can you pay?' Eleven dollars and fifty cents,' said Doan. "'You owe twenty. I aim to pay it when the hens begin to lay.' Hazen laughed scornfully. "'You aim to pay. Damn you, Marshy. If your old farm was worth taking, I'd have you out in this snow, you old scamp.' Doan pleaded dully. 
Don't you do that, Mr. Kinch. I aim to pay." Hazen clapped his hands on the table. Rats! Come, give me what you've got. And, Marshy, you'll have to get the rest. I'm sick of waiting on you. Marshy came shuffling toward the table. Hazen was sitting with the table between him and the man, and I was a little behind Hazen at one side. Marshy blinked as he came nearer, and his weak, nearsighted eyes turned from Hazen to me. I could see that the man was stiff with the cold. When he came to the table in front of Hazen, he took off his thick gloves. His hands were blue. He laid the gloves on the table and reached into an inner pocket of his torn coat and drew out a little cloth pouch, and he fumbled into this, and I heard the clink of coins. He drew out two quarters and laid them on the table before Hazen, and Hazen picked them up. I saw that Marshy's fingers moved stiffly. I could almost hear them creak with the cold. Then he reached into the pouch again. Something dropped out of the mouth of the little cloth bag and fell soundlessly on the table. It looked to me like a bill, a piece of paper currency. I was about to speak, but Hazen, without an instant's hesitation, had dropped his hand on the thing and drawn it unostentatiously toward him. When he lifted his hand, the money, if it was money, was gone. Marshy drew out a little roll of worn bills. Hazen took them out of his hand and counted them swiftly. All right, he said, eleven fifty. I'll give you a receipt. But you mind me, don't, Marshy, you get the rest before the month's out. I've been too slack with you. Marshy, his dull eyes watching Hazen write the receipt, was folding the little pouch and putting it away. Hazen tore off the bit of paper and gave it to him. Doan took it and said humbly, uh, Thanks, sir. Hazen nodded. Mind now, he exclaimed, and Marshy said, I'll do my best, Mr. Kinch. Then he turned and shuffled across the room and out into the hall, and we heard him descending the stairs. When he was gone, I asked Hazen casually, what was it that he dropped upon the table? A dollar, said Hazen promptly. A dollar bill, the miserable fool. Hazen's mental processes were always of interest to me. You mean to give it back to him? I asked. He stared at me and he laughed. No, if he can't take care of his own money, that's why he is what he is. Still, it is his money. He owes me more than that. Going to give him credit for it? am i a fool hazen asked me do i look like so much of a fool he may charge you with finding it he loses a dollar i find one can he prove ownership Sha! hazen laughed again if there is any spine in him he will lay the thing to you as a theft i suggested i was not afraid of angering hazen he allowed me open speech he seemed to find a grim pleasure in my distaste for him and for his way of life if there were any backbone in the man, he would not be paying me eighty dollars a year on a five hundred dollar loan, discounted. Hazen grinned at me triumphantly. I wonder if he will come back, I said. Besides, Hazen continued, he lied to me. He told me the eleven fifty was all he had. Yes, I agreed, there is no doubt he lied to you. Hazen had a letter to write, and he bent to it. I sat by the stove and watched him and considered. He had not yet finished the letter when we heard Marshy returning. His dragging feet on the stair were unmistakable. At the sound of his weary feet, some tide of indignation surged up in me. I was minded to do violence to Hazen Kinch, but a deeper impulse held my hand from the man. Marshy came in, and his weary eyes wandered about the room. They inspected the floor, they inspected me, they inspected Hazen Kinch's table, and they rose at last humbly to Hazen Kinch. Well, said Hazen, I lost a dollar, Marshy told him. I allowed I might have dropped it here. Hazen frowned. You told me eleven fifty was all you had. This here dollar warn't mine. The money lender laughed. Likely, who would give you a dollar? You lied to me, or you're lying now. I don't believe you lost a dollar. Marshy reiterated weakly, I lost a dollar. Well, said Hazen, there's no dollar of yours here. It was to get medicine, Marshy said. I want mine. Hazen Kinch exclaimed, By God, I believe you're accusing me. Marshy lifted both hands placatingly. No, Mr. Kinch, no, sir. His eyes once more wandered about the room. Maybe I dropped it in the snow, he said. He turned to the door. 
Even in his slow shuffle there was a hint of trembling eagerness to escape. He went out and down the stairs. Hazen looked at me, his old face wrinkling mirthfully. "'You see?' he said. I left him a little later and went out into the street. On the way to the hotel, I stopped for a cigar at the drug store. Marshy was there, talking with the druggist. I heard the druggist say, "'No, Marshy, I'm sorry. I've been stung too often.' Marshy nodded humbly. "'I didn't allow you'd figured to trust me,' he agreed. "'It's all right. I didn't allow you would.' It was my impulse to give him the dollar he needed, but I did not do it. An overpowering compulsion bade me keep my hands off in this matter. I did not know what I expected, but I felt the imminence of the fates. When I went out into the snow, it seemed to me the groan of the gale was like the slow grind of millstones, one upon the other. I thought long upon the matter of Hazen Kinch before sleep came that night. Toward morning the snow must have stopped, and the wind increased and carved the drifts till sunrise, then abruptly died. I met Hazen at the post office at ten, and he said, I'm starting home. I asked, Can you get through? He laughed. I will get through, he told me. You're in haste. I want to see that boy of mine, said Hazen Kinch. A fine boy, man. A fine boy. I'm ready, I said. When we took the road, the mare was limping, but she seemed to work out the stiffness in her knees, and after a mile or so of the hard going, she was moving smoothly enough. We made good time. The day, as often happens after a storm, was full of blinding sunlight. The glare of the sun upon the snow was almost unbearable. I kept my eyes all but closed, but there was so much beauty abroad in the land that I could not bear to close them altogether. The snow clung to twigs and to fences and to wires, and a thousand flames glinted from every crystal when the sun struck down upon the drifts. The pine wood upon the eastern slope of Rayburn Hill was a checkerboard of rich color. Green and blue and black and white, indescribably brilliant. When we crossed the bridge at the foot of the hill, we could hear the brook playing beneath the ice that sheathed it. On the white pages of the snow, wild things had writ here and there the fine-traced tale of their morning's adventuring. We saw once where a fox had pinned a big snowshoe rabbit in a drift. Hazen talked much of that child of his on the homeward way. I said little. From the top of Rayburn Hill we sighted his house, and he laid the whip along the mare, and we went down that last long descent at a speed that left me breathless. I shut my eyes and huddled low in the robes for protection against the bitter wind, and I did not open them again till we turned into Hazen's barnyard, plowed through the unpacked snow. When we stopped, Hazen laughed. Ah, he said, now come in, man, and warm yourself and see the baby, a fine boy. He was ahead of me at the door. I went in upon his heels. We came into the kitchen together. Hazen's kitchen was also living room and bedroom in the cold of winter. The arrangement saved firewood. There was a bed against the wall opposite the door. As we came in, a woman got up stiffly from this bed, and I saw that this woman was Hazen's wife. But there was a change in her. She was bleak as a cold iron, and she was somehow strong. Hazen rasped at this woman impatiently. "'Well, I'm home. Where is the boy?' She looked at him, and her lips moved soundlessly. She closed them, opened them again. This time she was able to speak. "'The boy?' she said to Hazen. "'The boy is dead.' The dim-lit kitchen was very quiet for a little time. I felt myself breathe deeply, almost with relief. The thing for which I had waited, it had come. And I looked at Hazen Kinch. He had always been a little thin man. He was shrunken now and very white and very still. Only his face twitched. A muscle in one cheek jerked and jerked and jerked at his mouth. It was as though he controlled a desire to smile. That jerking, suppressed smile upon his white and tortured countenance was terrible. I could see the blood drain down from his forehead, down from his cheeks. He became white as death itself. After a little he tried to speak. I do not know what he meant to say, but what he did was to repeat, 
as though he had not heard her words, the question which he had flung at her at the beginning. He said huskily, "'Where is the boy?' She looked toward the bed, and Hazen looked that way, and then he went across to the bed with uncertain little steps. I followed him. I saw the little twisted body there. The woman had been keeping it warm with her own body. It must have been in her arms when we came in. The tumbled coverings, the crushed pillows spoke mutely of a ferocious intensity of grief. Hazen looked down at the little body. He made no move to touch it, but I heard him whisper to himself, Fine boy! After a while he looked at the woman. She seemed to feel an accusation in his eyes. She said, I did all I could. He asked, What was it? I had it in me, though I had reason enough to despise the little man, to pity Hazen Kinch. He coughed, said the woman. I knew it was croup. You know I asked you to get the medicine, Ipasek. You said no matter, no need, and you had gone. She looked out of the window. I went for help to Annie Marshy. Her babies had had it. Her husband was going to town, and she said he would get the medicine for me. She did not tell him it was for me. He would not have done it for you. He did not know. So I gave her a dollar to give him, to bring it out to me. He came home in the snow last night. Baby was bad by that time, so I was watching for Doan. I stopped him in the road, and I asked him for the medicine. When he understood, he told me. He had not brought it. The woman was speaking dully, without emotion. It would have been in time, even then, she said. But after a while, after that, baby died. I understood in that moment the working of the mills, and when I looked at Hazen Kinch I saw that he, too, was beginning to understand. There is a just mercilessness in an aroused God. Hazen Kinch was driven to question, Why didn't Marshy fetch it? he asked. She said slowly, They would not trust him at the store. His mouth twitched. He raised his hands. The money, he cried, the money. What did he do with that? He said, the woman answered, that he lost it in your office, lost the money there. After a little, the old moneylender leaned far back like a man wrenched with agony. His body was contorted. His face was terrible. His dry mouth opened wide. He screamed. Halfway up the hill to my house, I stopped to look back and all around. The vast hills in their snowy garments looked down upon the land, upon the house of Hazen Kinch, still and silent and inscrutable. I knew now that a just and brooding God dwelt among these hills. End of Story 3